everyone, my name is Jessica Lyons and I'm a senior at Kent State University and I study conservation biology. I'm graduating this December and I've worked at the Honeybee Lab for the past three summers as a research intern. This past summer, I did a project where I raised bee larvae in the lab to test pesticides and combinations. So we tested pesticide and adjuvant combinations on honeybee larvae to measure their survival through adult emergence. So this project was closely related to the research that Emily does, but her work is more focused on adult mortality, whereas this project was more focused on the mortality of developing bees in the colony when contaminated pollen is brought back and is fed to the larvae. So we set up our experiment with a positive control of dimethoate, which we know to be toxic, and a negative solvent control, which should not be toxic. And this gives us benchmark numbers to compare our results to. We also tested the insecticides, fungicides, and the adjuvant on their own. Um, and this also gives us um, some baseline data. <laughs> and then we tested our combinations of insecticides, fungicides, and the adjuvant. So this is a graph showing insecticide usage during almond bloom from 2006 to 2017. So I highlighted the insecticides that we tested, Intrepid, Dimelin, and Ultacore, to show that we tested some of the most commonly used insecticides um, on almonds. And this graph also shows that after 2014, there was a sharp decline in insecticide usage because the California Almond Board recommended that farmers stop spraying insecticides during the almond bloom because that's when bees are foraging. This is a similar graph of fungicide usage during almond bloom, but on this one you see that fungicide usage did not decrease after 2014. But I still highlighted the fungicides that we tested to show that we tested some of the most commonly used ones including Tilt, Vanguard, Roverol, Pristine, and we also tested Luna Sensation, which is not on here, but it's in the same pesticide class as Pristine. Um, and here's a, another graph of adjuvant usage during almond bloom. So these are the chemicals that are sprayed to help make the pesticides work better, as Emily was explaining. Um, and there's a ton of different ones, but we tested Dynamic, which is one of the most commonly used adjuvants on almonds. So overall, our project was designed to compare normal bee development and bee survival to how many bees survive when you apply these combinations to see if they do have a significant effect on developing bees. So we use the Oppenol method for in vitro larval rearing. Uh, and this is very similar to the way that you would graft honeybee larvae to rear queens. So you'd use a grafting tool to extract the larvae from, directly from the cell on the frame, and you place them in the small plastic cups like you would for grafting queens here on the bottom. But instead, we use these brown small plastic cups that fit into our plastic well plate, and this allowed us to keep our larvae as they developed in an incubator in the lab. So in the incubator, the humidity is regulated so that the larvae didn't dry out and we fed them a diet of distilled water, sugars, yeast extract, and royal jelly. We sourced our royal jelly from Steakage, so it was commercial and it wasn't extracted by us. And that's important because we think the quality of the royal jelly may have impacted our the larval survival. Maybe if, you, if we used royal jelly collected from our colonies, they might have survived better, maybe better quality. But three days after grafting, they were fed a treated diet. So it was the same as before, except this time we added our test substance or the test combination. And we checked them daily to count how many were dead and to measure their mortality. On day seven through nine, um, the larvae were developing into pupae and those that had finished their diet were ready to be transferred to a new microplate that was lined with small pieces of Kimway. So that was to absorb any excess moisture so you, so you can see on the left, here's a pupae that had finished its diet, it's ready to be transferred. And on the right, this picture is a little bit further along, but it shows you what it would look like with the small piece of paper in the bottom. We ran into several roadblocks. So one of them I mentioned before is the royal jelly. 
Um, another one is that some of the larvae and pupae became infected with a fungus. I will move my picture. It, they became infected with a fungus called Aspergillus niger, which is black mold. And this mold is resistant to UV light, which is one of the methods that we were using to sterilize those plastic plates um, between each run, trial run of our experiment. So this impacted their survival. If it was really bad, we tried to throw those plates out. But we monitored the plates daily until adult emergence, which was approximately 20 days after grafting. This is a really good plate because you can see almost all of the cells have adult bees in them. So this would be a good plate, a good um, proportion of bees that emerged as adults. Um, so here are some of our results. The larval mortality with no spray adjuvant added. Um, I wanted to point out our solvent control is relatively high at 22%. Most regulatory agencies want it to be lower, like 15 to 20%. Um, but this method of rearing larvae in the lab is really hard. Um, there's a ton of different factors that can impact their survival. But overall, you can see some trends in toxicity when you have these various combinations, like most of the combinations that contain dimelin are really high and very toxic, and so is the combination of tilt and ultacor. And that one's interesting because that's another combination that Emily has seen is toxic in adult bees. And here is the larval mortality with the adjuvant in the diet. So it's very similar, except overall the percentages, the percentage of mortality was higher, but it's similar combinations that have the higher mortality. So in conclusion, um, we had higher control mortality than we would have liked to see, but overall you can still see the trends in mortality as you have these combinations of pesticides with the adjuvant. Um, and this is the kind of study that substantiates um, the decision not to use insecticides and adjuvants during almond bloom. Um, and this is more data to show how these combinations can impact bee brood when bees bring that contaminated pollen back to the colonies. So I'd like to take a minute to thank everyone who helped with this project at both the Worcester and Columbus Honeybee Labs and the Almond Board of California for funding this project. Thank you. Hello, thank you all so much for being here. I'm thrilled to speak with you about my research. My name is Harper McMinn Souter, and I'm a graduate student at The Ohio State University working in the Department of Entomology. And the research that I'm gonna speak on today is titled Flowers Supporting Honeybees in the Ohio Agroecosystem. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of background so I can introduce myself to y'all. I'm currently a third year PhD student working in Dr. Reed Johnson's lab uh, over at the Ratham Bueller Bee Lab at OSU. I earned my bachelor's degree from Wichita State University in Wichita, Kansas, and that's also where I started beekeeping. So my grandpa started beekeeping when we were, he retired, and it became a hobby that, that we're able to do together. So that's kind of what introduced me to my research interests. And the, the research and the questions that I'm interested in answering generally pertain to how honeybee foraging in the agroecosystem influences colony health. So trying to understand the connection between floral resource use, so what flowers the bees are foraging on, and health and productivity of the colony. And so ways that I'm answering these questions and things that I'm really interested in understanding is trying to identify the flowers that are present for foraging honeybees in these landscapes and identifying where they're coming from within this, this large ecosystem. And if we understand the resources that are being used and where we can find them, we can better tailor this agricultural landscape for foraging honeybees as well as native pollinators. Beyond this, I'm interested in the role of pollinator plantings. So these are things like the Conservation Reserve Program that are designing seed mixes specifically for foraging pollinators. So I'm curious to understand the resources that are present within those seed mixes for foraging bees and trying to tease out how much the bees are actually using these resources. So have some sort of quantifiable way to measure honeybee usage of these pollinator seed mixes. So when bees are foraging in their landscape, they require both diverse and abundant 
both pollen and nectar resources throughout the entire season. And they must find these resources within their foraging range on the landscape in which they're placed. And we see that bees perform differently when they're located in different landscapes. So for example, a bee in an urban environment doesn't necessarily perform the same as a bee in an agricultural landscape. And there are a number of reasons that this may be occurring. There could be differential exposure to stressors, which are things like pests or pesticides. Or what I'm most focused on is the differences in floral resource availability. So how are we seeing different flowers be present within these landscapes that could be possibly influencing either the health or the productivity of the colony. So what nutritional differences are these bees experiencing when they're in these different regions? And we see that when we look at Ohio, honeybees perform fairly well when they're located in this agricultural landscape. And so I'm curious to understand what resources they have available to them that are causing this um, differential um, health effect. So when we're looking at the Ohio agroecosystem as a whole, there are a number of places that bees could be finding forage. The first of those is crops. So these can provide a mass flowering resource during peak bloom. And the crop that we're most interested in at the Bee Lab is soybean. And so this is a potential very strong mid-season resource and it's a mass flowering resource, which means this large patch would take a very long time to exhaust in contrast to something that's a small patch, like a small patch of clover would be exhausted by the foragers very quickly. And since so much of Ohio and so much of the Midwest is covered in soybeans and is covered in cropland, it's important for us to understand if they could be, or if these landscapes could be providing resources that we may not be thinking about. Because if so, it could potentially allow the reallocation of resources into other periods of bloom where there may be less natural forage available, excuse me, less natural forage available for um, both honeybees and native pollinators. In addition to crops, Weeds can provide abundant resources for foraging bees when they're present. So these are things like clovers and dandelions that are often present on crop edges, roadsides, and ditches. And a third potential resource for foraging honeybees in the Ohio agroecosystem is conservation land. So these are things like Conservation Reserve Program or Pheasants Forever that may be planting pollinator specific seed mixes. And these have the potential to provide resources throughout the entire season, particularly at the end of the season where there may be little else available on the landscape for foraging bees. So when we're looking at this ecosystem as a whole, there's potential for consistent resources throughout the entire season. And I want to know where they're coming from. So we have all of these options of where they could be, but what are the bees actually using? And which of these resources are the most beneficial for colony health? And so many of our bees in Ohio are placed in agricultural landscapes. So this question is important for all of us, those of us that, that are, are in this region or in the Midwest in which much of our land is covered in agriculture. So the question with this research study is how does agricultural intensity influence colony health and productivity? So how does resource availability for bees change over space and time when we're looking at an agricultural gradient? What does any sort of uh, positive health effect that could be experienced by the colony um, have to do with proximity to CRP? So how much are these bees using this conservation reserve program resource? And where could we see potential for improvement? And how can we use remote monitoring, specifically in the form of continuous weight data of colonies to understand the landscape? So how can we use this continuous monitoring technique to understand what's going on in the landscape without physically being out there surveying? So to do this, we established 13 apiaries around Columbus at a gradient of agricultural intensity. So these high apiaries or these high dots indicate or these red dots, excuse me, indicate high agricultural intensity with greater than 70%. The yellow dots indicate medium agricultural intensity with 40 to 70%, and the blue dots indicate low agricultural intensity with less than 40%. And these were all calculated within two kilometer radius around the apiary. So each apiary was situated with five colonies, three of which were fitted with dead bee traps that were collected roughly once a week. They had brood minders, so these are, are weight scales that are continuously collecting weight data throughout the entire season, and they all had monthly uh, colony inspections at which we collected nectar samples directly out of the hives. We also had two colonies that were pollen trapped uh, where samples were collected roughly once a week through the season. 
So we collected both bulk pollen out of the pollen traps and nectar samples directly out of the colonies. And we'll be performing a pollen metabarcoding analysis on all of these samples. So essentially what we're doing is we'll be extracting pollen out of these nectar samples and then homogenizing our bulk pollen samples to try to get a representative look of the plants that are, are contributing to those samples. So once we sequence those, those samples, we will curate a library using the USDA plants database as well as NCBI sequences to compare our samples to. We'll then use a research alignment technique to line up or match up our sample sequences with our library sequences. And we'll use a meta curator method to identify the taxonomic origin of those sequences. So essentially I'll have a list of all of the plants that are contributing pollen into both our bulk, bulk pollen and our nectar samples. And we'll have proportional abundances so we can identify um, which are major resources and which are minor resources. So we're also using these broodminder hive scales, and these collect continuous weight data throughout the entire season, allowing us to see season-long colony weight dynamics. So we're seeing periods of growth and periods of loss. And this can also show us the landscape flow phenology. So this is showing us the resource availability change that we see over time and space when they're located in all of these different regions. And it can help us identify the plants are that are contributing to periods of nectar flow. And here we have some preliminary results where the positive slope, the growth, indicates colony weight gain and a nectar flow on the landscape, where the negative slope indicates a colony weight loss and a dearth period on the landscape. And on our x-axis, we have date throughout the season. Our y-axis is our reconstructed normalized weight. And we can see that many of our colonies are having periods of growth in July. And this is during, during soybean bloom, which is exciting for us because it's showing that bees may be using soybean as a mid-season resource. And it will allow us to verify these results using pollen metabarcoding data on those collected nectar samples. So this research is exciting because it's, it demonstrates potential to provide insight into the resources that are present for bees in this agricultural landscape, which has implications both for agricultural land management, but also for colony placement for beekeepers. And beyond this, it demonstrates preliminarily the potential for soybean as a mid-season resource. And hopefully this study and other research that we're doing in the lab will help us better understand honeybee foraging in this agricultural landscape and in Ohio as better as a whole. So I would like to thank y'all for having me out here today. I really I appreciate you guys listening to my talk. I'd like to thank all of the members of the Johnson Lab that helped me with this research, as well as the Ohio Supercomputer Center for their computational resources. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions that y'all may have over email. Um, feel free to reach out if you have anything that you would, you would love to learn more about. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Dylan. I am a graduate student at Ohio State University in the lab of Reed Johnson. And as you can see, the title of my talk today is Hot Potato, the Movement and Colony Level Effects of Systemic Pesticides and Miticides. I'll just uh, briefly go over the agenda for my talk. It'll start with some background in the research area uh, that I study, the importance of metals and answering some uh, knowledge gaps in that area. And then uh, I'll describe my own research, which uh, covers the uh, effects of metals from the individual to the colony, and then some uh, preliminary results and next steps. So if you're watching this video, you probably already have an appreciation for bees. Uh, they're so hardworking and responsible for pollinating so many of our crops. They're also super diverse. There's over 4,000 species of bees in North America alone. And for these reasons, they're an environmental icon. Unfortunately, there's evidence of uh, population declines in different bee taxa or groups of bees. In terms of honeybees, um, as a whole, they may not be in decline, but uh, every year the rate of uh, colony losses um, faced by beekeepers across the country has generally uh, increased. Um, you can see in this map that between 2018 and 2019, between 30 and 40 percent of bee colonies across the country uh, were lost, um, which is upwards of between 10 and 20 percent historically. And a lot of attention has gone to the role of toxic substances, in particular pesticides. And you can see from this map the uh, increased usage of certain pesticides uh, after being weighted uh, for their 
uh, toxicity to adult honeybees. And you can see a lot of that increased usage has taken place in the Midwest. But in addition to pesticides, uh, bees are also exposed to metals, not just in urban areas, but also in agriculture. I've listed a few different sources of metals in agriculture on this slide. Um, the ones I'm most interested in are uh, still in development. Um, so metals are being incorporated into uh, pesticides that are right now in development and will uh, likely come to market in some form uh, in the coming years. This includes zincicide, uh, which uses zinc to target bacterial infections of citrus trees, and lithium chloride, which is actually uh, in development to treat varroa mites and honeybees. Um, this graph that I've included on this slide shows the survival of bees and mites after uh, the honeybees were fed uh, syrup containing lithium chloride. You can see the mites that were feeding on the honeybees and being exposed to the lithium that way uh, died off uh, very quickly um, over the course of a week, whereas uh, the survival of honeybees was barely affected at all. And so this is very promising as a treatment for varroa mite, although uh, some additional evidence uh, also shows that it may be uh, toxic to uh, honeybee brood. Um, I'll point out that both zincicide and lithium chloride uh, would be used uh, systemically, meaning that they'll first uh, be used or treated to uh, one organism, either citrus trees or honeybees, before reaching the target organism, uh, bacteria or varroa mites. And so this raises the question of how honeybees that are exposed to these pesticides uh, then transmit them to the rest of the colony. Um, and this is true not just of the uh, systemic metal-based pesticides that I just pointed out, but also ones that are already on the market. Um, and this is a fairly complicated question uh, that's been in the literature and being actively researched uh, for over a decade. Um, and it involves the whole social structure of the honeybee colony. Um, it also raises the question of the relative susceptibility of different life stages to these uh, chemicals um, and at what rate it moves not just between bees but also into their food um, and to uh, developing bees. And so besides being uh, common in the environment and being uh, incorporated into uh, new products, metals are also just inherently useful to understand how things move within colonies and how that affects uh, colony health. Uh, this is because they don't break down like uh, your typical um, very chemically complicated pesticides that are currently on the market. Um, rather, they actually bioaccumulate in living things. Um, and so they're uh, much more uh, easy to measure um, and traceable within colonies. And there's been some work already on the accumulation of metal uh, in different life stages of bees. You can see from this graph that in a colony that was fed syrup containing selenium, which is a metal, it accumulated at different rates in the different life stages uh, within that colony, uh, which is very interesting. Um, it might affect uh, the health and performance of different life stages and the overall fate of the colony. I'm especially interested um, in this particular route of exposure, which uh, goes through nurse bees into royal jelly and then into brood. And this touches on research that I've already done um, uh, about a year ago when I joined Ohio State uh, in Cleveland, where we or where I set out bumblebee colonies and urban farms in Cleveland. And then after about two months, I dissected the colonies and uh, we'll be analyzing the different life stages of those bumblebees uh, shortly for different metals. Besides being uh, measurable uh, from colonies, metals also have pronounced time cumulative effects, meaning that even at very low um, concentrations in the environment, um, over time, because they bioaccumulate, they can have uh, dramatic effects to survival of various different living things. This graph shows the survival of adult honeybees that were fed a syrup containing arsenic. Um, and the units here are milligrams per liter, which is the same as parts per million. 
meaning that for every million water and sugar molecules in this uh, uh, diet, only two um, in the lowest treatment group here uh, of those molecules would have been arsenic. And so it's uh, unbelievably dilute, and yet over 10 days, you can see that the survival of even uh, that very low treatment group uh, tapered down a lot compared to the uh, group that was not treated with any uh, metal. And besides all that, there's also this uh, very interesting literature uh, using honeybee colonies to monitor metal uh, levels in the wider environment. And this recently uh, made a headline. Researchers from British Columbia uh, measured uh, lead from uh, honeybee colonies throughout Paris and were able to uh, trace the fallout of lead from the uh, Notre Dame fire, um, which is just a very interesting uh, application of this sort of research. And, uh, you know, got us here in the lab uh, pretty excited to see. In terms of my own research, you could say it's tiered, um, moving from the individual level up to the colony level with modeling in the middle. And so at the individual level in the lab, I'm looking at how metals bioaccumulate and affect the survival of adult bees. And using data from other labs, I am uh, modeling how uh, realistic levels of metals in the environment might affect the survival of honeybee colonies. And then um, at the colony level, I'm running two different types of experiments with honeybee colonies um, to see how these metals are uh, translocated or move into nurses, royal jelly, and brood and affect brood production. And using those um, results, I'm hoping to validate the uh, modeling approaches in the middle. Um, a previous version of this talk talked more about the modeling and all that. But for today's talk, I'll just talk about the uh, colony level assays that I've been doing. Um, this being the uh, Ohio uh, Beekeepers Association. I'm sure um, viewers of my talk uh, will be familiar with uh, queen rearing, at least uh, passingly. And so in the center of this slide, you can see a queen rearing box. And uh, just like commercial beekeepers would, to rear out a bunch of queens. We load this box with a bunch of young larvae and queen cups, nurse bees, and food. Um, but in our case, we also uh, treat the syrup with uh, metals. And then four days later, we collect the uh, queen cocoons, um, dissect them for the queen larvae. Uh, we also take out the royal jelly and take a subsample of the nurse bees from the queen rearing boxes and we're having those analyzed for different metals. The uh, second colony level uh, experiment that I've been uh, conducting um, takes a bunch of larger uh, colonies and miniaturizes them into experimental nucleus colonies, which you can see on the right. And um, each of these uh, nucleus colonies has their frames labeled with these special barcodes that you can see in the middle. Um, we currently have nine of these, and this is just a, a pilot project to uh, work out the methods. Um, but using these barcodes, uh, we'll be periodically taking uh, photos of these brood frames and uh, measuring overall brood production over time in each of these colonies with or without uh, syrup that's been treated with, in this case, zinc. But we're hoping to eventually also do uh, this experiment with lithium chloride and potentially uh, another metal. This uh, photography rig that you can see on this slide uh, has been uh, under development by my advisor, Reed Johnson. We're hoping that it'll finally come to fruition um, uh, through this experiment. So we're periodically taking these photos of the brood frames and uploading them into a computer program, which we're training to uh, automatically count the eggs and larvae and capped brood cells uh, on these frames. And in addition to brood production, we're also hoping to measure uh, the foraging activity of these colonies and how that's affected by metals. Currently, just one colony uh, has a hive scale underneath it. Um, but in the future, we'll be putting more of these scales underneath uh, more colonies. And using these scales, 
you can see uh, the drop in weight uh, of colony weight every morning as uh, the foragers fly out and begin to forage. And so by collecting uh, this weight data from enough colonies over enough mornings, um, and also just looking at the growth of these colonies uh, over time, um, we'll be uh, uh, eventually seeing the effects of these metals to foraging and also overall colony growth. That's all I have for now. Uh, thank you for attending my talk. Here are my references. Here is my acknowledgments uh, slide. See you next time. Hello, my name is Jacob Schumann. I am a senior at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. My major is in agriculture community leadership, specializing in extension education with a minor in entomology. I have been a research assistant in the Department of Entomology for the past four years, and I am an eight-year beekeeper. I am working under the direction of Dr. Reed Johnson. My research with distinction project is entitled Finding Drone Congregation Areas in Ohio. Drone congregation areas, or DCAs, are where drones fly and congregate after leaving their hides. These locations are thought to be found 50 feet to 130 feet above the ground. DCAs are found usually near an open space, near a tree line or hill. Drones fly to those DCAs in routes called flyways. Drones found in the DCAs come from different hives. Initially, my quest was to see if I could locate a DCA using these parameters just listed and if I could mimic what happens when a queen enters a DCA and the drones compete to mate with the queen. I investigated whether the drones that were outside the hive in the afternoon were sexually immature versus mature. To illustrate this behavior, a drone bee fishing net was constructed to capture the drone bees that were actively pursuing a queen out on her maiden flight. For the queen bee simulation, I used 9ODA as a bait. The net was suspended by a balloon attached to a fishing line and flown at various times of the afternoon. I observed whether drones could be caught into the net and reeled in so that I could determine if they were mature versus immature. I located three sites this summer in rural Ohio. An additional DCA site was found in 2019 in Worcester, Ohio. The three sites found this year were found in Chillicothe, Frankfort, and Williamsport, Ohio. Each site was visited multiple times. Some sites visits where a small sampling of drones was found were noted but not included in the graph. Here is a satellite image of the Chillicothe site. You can see the tree line, open area, and water source. There are currently no managed beehives located in the city nearby. At the time that I found the DCA, I was not aware of the water source nearby to the tree line. The Sayadaw River is nearby about a quarter mile. When the satellite map was viewed, a local water source was found just behind the tree line. The Frankfurt site, there is a small pond nearby. There were crops in the field found near the sampling site. And the Williamsport site had a storm water drainage nearby. There were several farms located nearby for a food source. The total drones collected at each site in the net were the following, and these bar graphs show the ratio of mature drones versus immature drones. For the Chillicothe area site, here is the ratio between mature and immature drones. Here is a photo of the landscape at the Chillicothe site. Here is a photograph of the bees in the net. Here is the data that I collected from the Frankfurt site. Here is a picture of me observing the drones that I collected. While I was flying the balloon in this picture, you should also take note of the forage nearby. and the Williamsport site. Notice the numbers of drones collected. If you look in this image, look for the forage nearby. In this image, here are the drones that I collected during the sampling period. 
Once I located these DCAs, the questions became to decide if any other factors such as a landscape findings of forage and a local water source nearby played a role in the number of drones found and to see if the time of year increased the probability of me finding a DCA. When there was a dearth in our area and there were limited forage conditions for the honeybees, drones rearing slowed down. The landscape factors were important, for example. Flower availability and water sources nearby mattered. It seems that there is a potential for a reduced number of drones at a DCA if forage is not available. In conclusion, my sampling results for the data collected were three drone congregation areas were found from June to October of 2020. The results found were, the days were sunny to partly cloudy days. The temperatures ranged from 79 degrees Fahrenheit to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The humidity was less than 50%. The time of day was from 3.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. The months when sampling was conducted were late June to late August of 2020. Catching drones was affected by the dearth in our area that occurred in late July and early August. Lower drone numbers were found then. The average wind speed was less than 5 miles per hour. Geography or the terrain, open field near the tree line but not close to the trees, the drones had a clear line of sight to the net, nearby water sources were found like a pond. There was an approximate 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 ratio mature drone bees to immature drone bees that were caught each time. If a small sample size was collected, only mature drones were found. You hear the drone bees before you see them. I was able to put the drones out of the DCA with a few drops of the pheromone. The drones were competing with each other and flying into the breeze. There was a distinct drone comet shape to their flight pattern. I imagine some drones were chasing other drones to get to the queen in the net. Lastly, thank you for your time and thanks to the Ohio State Beekeepers Association. Hi there, my name is Emily Walker and I am a graduate student at The Ohio State University and today I am going to be talking to you about adjuvants, what they are, and why you as a beekeeper should care about them. So before we talk about adjuvants, I just have to quickly define pesticides. Um, so what pesticides are, are chemicals that are applied on crops to deter or kill pests. And by doing that, you will inherently increase your crop yields. Uh, pesticides are highly regulated by the EPA. There are very strict guidelines that farmers and producers have to follow, and uh, they go through a lot of rigorous safety uh, trials as well to make sure that they're safe for both humans and honeybees. And there are many different types of pesticides and their names are usually uh, pest specific. So pesticide is kind of this umbrella term and then you have your specific pesticide that you're actually looking at. So for example, an insecticide or a fungicide. And insecticides are for controlling insects, fungicides are for controlling fungi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for this presentation, we're just gonna be looking at insecticides and fungicides. So how are honeybees uh, exposed to these pesticides? Uh, honeybees are recruited for their pollination abilities uh, in the agricultural industry. Uh, so they're essential pollinators. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's interesting for uh, almonds, honeybees are the only pollinator that's active during the almond blooming period. So they're actually the sole pollinator of almonds. So my research specifically focuses on that system uh, because honeybees and almonds are the only thing that's interacting during that blooming period so we don't have to worry about competition um, and now we have to think about how are these honeybees exposed to pesticides during bloom while they're pollinating and the way that happens is i've got a picture of a sprayer here this is an air blast sprayer going through an orchard so we can imagine this is an almond orchard and we have our honeybee who is currently pollinating a almond flower uh, and this sprayer can come by and she will then be sprayed with whatever is in this tank. And so that is considered the direct spray exposure pathway. Now there's a couple other exposure pathways such as the oral or contact. And so that's maybe the bee misses the initial spraying, but she'll come after and touch a contaminated uh, flower. 
Uh, and then she can also bring that pesticide back into the hive as well. So those are some other exposure pathways, but I'm only looking at direct spray. And so how we figure out what pesticides these honeybees are exposed to, we look at this CalPIP database, which is the California Pesticide Information Portal. Uh, they do a great job of cataloging cataloging all their pesticides, um, and we're able to answer the question, what pesticides are applied on almonds during bloom? So we've got insecticides on the left here and fungicides on the right, and really all this graph is showing you is just each different color is a different treatment, and the y-axis is just how much is applied and then over time. And so I'm not gonna go deep into these, uh, that's really all you need to know, but it just kind of gives you an idea of what's applied. And so this, this uh, pest, presentation, excuse me, this presentation, uh, we're talking about adjuvants. So you may be wondering at this point, all right, how do adjuvants fit in the mix of all of this? And uh, thank you for asking that question because ironically enough, pesticides are often applied in a tank mix. And so what this, this is showing is we've got kind of our tractor pulling our tank and then what's not shown is the sprayer, but I showed you that in a previous picture. And so this tank has a lot of different things in it. And this is kind of like what is applied onto all these plants. And so the different colors represent different things. So we can have an insecticide in there, a fungicide, our pesticide adjuvant that I haven't talked about yet, but I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then water to make sure that it's all kind of like a liquid formulation that can easily be sprayed. And the reason they combine all these things is just to save time and money. It makes total sense. Um, but what my research does is, is I look at the combination of all these things and how that could potentially be toxic for honeybees. And so now let's get into the meat of this presentation and talk about what actually is an adjuvant or uh, the specific term is agricultural spray adjuvant or pesticide adjuvant as well. Uh, and what that is, is it is a substance that's added to a tank mix to improve the performance of a pesticide. And that's a lot of big fancy words. It essentially means it makes the pesticide better. It makes it more effective. Uh, and so what this image kind of shows is one example of how an adjuvant can do that. So this is showing a plant surface. We've got some hairs on that leaf. And with the pesticide just by itself, it's not able to penetrate past those hairs uh, and be effective. But when we add an adjuvant, it'll change something about that pesticide so that it can now penetrate the plant surface and do its intended function. And so there's really three main types of these adjuvants. There's surfactants, oil-based, and spray utility agents. And you don't need to know the specifics. And re really, there's just kind of two groups within here. There's the types of adjuvants that change the physical composition of the pesticide and the type of adjuvants that change the chemical composition of the pesticide. And really what I mean by that is physical composition is this is kind of an example of that. It'll change something about the surface tension, make it more oily, something like that. Uh, and then the chemical change would be like making it more acidic or basic, something like that. And so when we're talking about adjuvants, we often refer to them as the wild west of pesticides. And, and what we mean by that is adjuvants differently from pesticides are lightly regulated. They have to have a label, the EPA has to know what's in them, but in terms of whether or not they have to be applied at a certain concentration isn't really very strict. So that's what I mean by lightly regulated. There's many, many different kinds, as I showed you on the previous, uh, previous slide, there's many different kinds, each have a different function. You could have multiple adjuvants in a tank mix, you don't just have, have to have one. Uh, and then finally, it is a newer area of research as well. So adjuvants have been around for a very long time, but specifically for like honeybee research, uh, we are now just getting into adjuvants and looking at this. So this presentation is really kind of the edge of what we know about adjuvants. So yeah, that's exciting. And so similarly to before, we looked at this pesticide information portal to get information on adjuvants. Um, and so our y-axis, how much is applied over time. Uh, and really all I want you to get from this is that there's a lot of adjuvants. There's a lot more here than there were on the insecticide and fungicide uh, graphs combined. Uh, but for this presentation, I'm just gonna be looking at dynamic, which is the most popular adjuvant. And so you might be wondering at this point, why should I, as a beekeeper, care about adjuvants? And that's where I and my research come into play. The question that I'm trying to answer is, are pesticide adjuvants toxic to honeybees? Could this tank mix be causing honeybee mortality? And so we designed an experiment to determine the toxicity of these adjuvant treatments and what these honeybees are exposed to. And so this is kind of showing what we did uh, to prepare our honeybees. So I wanted to look at adult honeybees that could be pollinating these flowers. 
And so I collected a frame of brood of honeybees that had not been exposed to pesticides. I brushed them into a cage, aged them to three days old in an incubator. And then once they were adults, I um, treated them with carbon dioxide to uh, kind of knock them out, make them sleepy so they weren't flying around. And at that point, I would treat them with, you know, whatever adjuvant or insecticide I was looking at. And then finally, after three days, I would determine how many bees died after each treatment to analyze mortality. And so this is just a picture of me using the Potter spray tower, which is the machine I use to treat our honeybees. So I would put the adjuvant in, or uh, excuse me, I would put the treatment uh, in here in this test tube. It gets sucked up and sprayed through this nozzle and down the tower onto our awaiting honeybees, which you see here. This is a honeybee in our pest, or in our petri dish. <laughs> And then I would put them into these cups and after three days, look at how many died. And so what we did is uh, I, we did a lot, a lot of different treatments, but I don't have enough time to talk about them. So I'm just going to talk about three treatments that I applied. And those three treatments were the insecticide Ultipore by itself, the adjuvant Dynamic by itself. And then I put these two in combination to kind of simulate that tank mix environment. And so what we saw is the insecticide Altacore by itself had no significant toxicity. So what this graph is showing is the proportion of bees that died. So you can consider one like 100%, zero, zero percent. Um, and we saw that at any concentration we applied, we didn't see significant mortality. Uh, and for reference, this one X concentration is the recommended label rate. So that's what the, the label says you should apply. And we went a little bit above, a little bit below. We saw that even at 100 times what's recommended, we didn't see any significant mortality. So that's good. That's good for bees. And then we looked at the adjuvant dynamic by itself, and we did see toxicity there. Um, but it is important to note that at the recommended field application rate, we did not see any significant toxicity. And the next thing we did was apply these in combination. And we knew from this previous graph that, um, excuse me, we knew from this previous graph that there was going to be toxicity if we applied dynamic at higher concentrations. So we kept dynamic fixed at the 1x concentration. So what you see here is that dynamic, while it's kept fixed, as we increase the concentration of Altipore, we see increased mortality. Um, which is a very interesting result, and I, you know, want to look into the mechanism of that. But uh, the most important thing to see here is that at the field application rate, so both dynamic and Altacore are applied as recommended on the label, we saw about 30% of our honeybees dying, which is considered significant. So really looking forward, what we need to look at next is why, what's the mechanism behind uh, this toxicity, uh, but I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but the important thing is that I don't know the answer yet. I'm looking into it. We, as scientists, are looking into it. So like I said, you are on the edge of what we know. Um, so I'm, I'm just excited to share this with you. I, I, I hope that you, you learned something about adjuvants and I hope that you know, you know that they're not great. So if you hear anybody talking about applying them, maybe think twice. <laughs> so. Uh, with that, I think I'll end this presentation. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to thank our uh, the Alma Board and OSU for their support, as well as people in the Johnson Lab. Thank you.